Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on what has to be another one of the most muggy and miserable, crappy, shitty Florida mornings ever. I mean, it's bad. Uh, dripping again, humidity, fighting it. It's just rotten, and uh, it's, of course, here for at least the next few weeks, if not months, and uh, there's just not a damn thing I can do about it. Uh, yesterday, I was going to do this video, but... Um, Apparently, they spent like two days detailing the underneath of this car, and uh, it was raining yesterday, and it was informed, I was informed that if I drove it, if I got it wet underneath, I'd be shot. I'd be summarily executed. So uh, I said, the hell with it. I'm going to leave it at home. I'm going to take the day off, and I did. I had a lovely day at home. I did yard work, and uh, it was uh, unusually... I won't say it was cool, but it was uh, bizarrely nice Florida weather yesterday, so I got a lot done and it was fantastic and pushed everything off until today. Uh, I do have to apologize. I know it's been a very long time since I've done a video, uh, at least um, Monday of last week when we did that beetle, uh, and uh, I don't know why. It's just, you know, it's the doldrums of summer. I'm having trouble getting stuff ready, and uh, the few cars that I do have... Uh, that are close. I'm just not uh, prepared to do a video on yet. So, yeah, you know, we, we knocked out a few a couple of weeks ago, had a good run, and uh, now we've got uh, a little bit of a sparse count for a while. So, uh, hopefully I can drum some stuff up and keep things going. Uh, today I have... Today I have this 1978 Ferrari 308 GTS. Now, I have to say this. I've done a couple of Ferraris before. I did some... Uh, I don't know, like a 599 Carly Fiorina or something a couple of years ago. And uh, I did Andrew's, uh, <clears throat> or, uh, you know, anyway, that was supposed to be anonymous, uh, California a few <laughs> weeks ago. And they were all fine, and they're all very exciting. But they're nothing like this. And I'll tell you why. I mean, this is one of the iconic cars of my youth. I mean, words cannot describe how awesome this car was to me between the ages of 10 and 17 when I was first made aware of it. Uh, you know, as a young skull full of mush coming up in life, I, I you know, you, you don't know anything. You're just... You know, that's why I always say, you know, a kid looks at this thing today and he sees a Model T and, you know, he's in love with whatever new thing came out of Marnello. Well, when I was a kid, this was what was new out of Marnello, and I absolutely loved it. So I'm sure it's all generational as well, and uh, I doubt very much that I'd have the same love for it today uh, if I were just a young punk, a little snowflake kid running around with Play-Doh and coloring books and safe spaces and, you know, whatever it else. Uh, they, You know, I made the mistake yesterday. There's uh, snow flakes at work and there's a lot of them there now ever since Peter sold out and uh, they, you know I, I said you know they're a bunch of whippersnappers and then I thought oh my god what if what if whippersnapper is racist, you know? And then someone suggested they wouldn't know what a whippersnapper was, and I that doesn't matter. It can easily be racist even if they don't know what it is. I mean, that's the way those people work. So, uh, But as it turns out, I think it was okay because I didn't trigger any of the snowflakes, and they're all still fine, thank God. But uh, let me get back into the car for a minute. Anyway, so when I was a kid, I mean, I first probably was introduced to it in Hot Wheels form when I was a very young kid playing and, you know, the sandbox with my Hot Wheels. Uh, then I started to see it in TV and the movies. And uh, eventually I would read about it and all the variants of it in car magazines. And, you know, it just became one of the one of the seminal cars of my childhood and uh, young adulthood and, you know, something that I lusted after. And, uh, you know, in the TV and the movies, of course, you remember the Cannonball Run. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin drove one of these while dressed as priests. You know, if you haven't seen that movie, if you're someone young, you know, it's before your time or whatnot, go check it out. As far as uh, cars go and personalities, you really can't do much better. Uh, but anyway, they drove that. That was fascinating to me. Uh, and then, of course, there was uh, Christy Brinkley, very hot-looking, youthful Christy Brinkley, driving one in uh, National Lampoon's Vacation, if you remember that. And uh, she was running alongside of Chevy Chase and the family truckster with the hair blowing and the top down and, you know, of course, looked fantastic. And there it was. But, of course, the most famous use of this car, the most famous incarnation, was in Magnum P.I., 
and that's where Tom Selleck drove one with the license plate Robin 1 uh, all around Oahu, uh, Ohio, Ohio. I like that, Ohio. You know, there's the coronavirus whiskey coming in again. It's a little mixture of Ohio and Hawaii. <sighs> he drove run around... <laughs> Oahu, Hawaii, uh, you know, go, and, and of course, you know, I couldn't think of a worse car for a private investigator to have. Maybe that was part of the irony of the show. But I mean, people look at this thing when it pulls up. They certainly do today. I have no doubt they did back then. If you're trying to conduct a stakeout or something, I mean, there really is not a worse vehicle you could do it in, in terms of not being noticed. So it seemed pretty stupid, but uh, it worked fantastically well, uh, at least for Ferrari and also for the show. Uh, one interesting side note on that is the uh, uh, CBS originally wanted to use the Porsche 928. Uh, you know, that was kind of an up and coming car at the time. And they got in touch with the Porsche guys and said, look, you know, we want to use this car, but um, it's Hawaii. We need to have it open top. You need to make either a really giant sunroof or a target top or, you know, some such so we can highlight, you know, the, uh, the, the nice weather. And uh, Porsche said, yeah, 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 you know, no, I don't think so. I think we'll just keep it the way it is. Uh, typical German arrogance. Uh, the Porsche 928, of course, was a sales disappointment. I mean, it was a neat car, but it certainly didn't sell the way they thought it would. And it never had a chance of replacing the 928. 11, which was intended. Meanwhile, this Ferrari, in part because of the exposure it got on Magnum PI, uh, became the best-selling Ferrari of all time, and in fact, probably was the seminal car, there I go, you're overusing words again, uh, that brought Ferrari out of being a a niche company for enthusiasts and into this big international uh, standard of the money to meet, you know, that, um, that that changed the whole dynamic of the company from something sort of small into something on the tip of everybody's tongue. I mean, now everybody knows what a Ferrari is, and that is uh, that is in no small part because of that television show uh, and this particular car. I mean, it made a big, big splash. Um, so anyway, it would have been interesting. You know, you've got a bit of an Axis power rivalry there if uh, the Germans had let them use the 28. Yeah, maybe that's the car we'd all be thinking of today instead of this one. Um, but anyway, well, growing up, these exotic cars were really otherworldly to me. I mean, they were just of a completely different planet. I mean, Naples was kind of a rich town even back then, even if we weren't rich, my family. And I mean, God knows, my dad could have been a billionaire back then. He was way too cheap to buy a Ferrari. So uh, it was certainly out of my league. But you'd see him driving around. You know, there are some well-to-do people in Naples. Uh, and so, you know, you get to walk up to one in a parking lot or something. But otherwise, they were just like from another planet. They were otherworldly. They were just an intangible thing, a poster on my wall, not unlike Tawny Catane, you know, this unattainable uh, but uh, amazing thing that existed and you just wanted to be a part of it. Uh, so getting to play with this car has been a real treat for me. I mean, it's almost the fulfillment of a childhood dream, as hokey as that sounds. I mean, this meant a lot to me as a kid, this car. I would have loved to have uh, you know, it would have meant everything to me to have one back in the day or to be able to drive one. And of course, I never could. So now that I can, uh, it really is quite a uh, quite an absolute treat. And in fact, more of a treat than if somebody, you know, let me play with Tawny Catane today, because frankly, this Ferrari aged a lot better than um, than she did. God rest her soul. Anyway, I digress. As uh, you know, as everyone knows, Ferrari is the name of Enzo Ferrari. Uh, one of the industry giants. I mean, an amazing personality in the world of cars, obviously. And uh, a guy with a reputation for being an unbelievable bastard, which may or not be earned. Yeah, may, I don't know. You know, who's to say? Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I won't name any, uh, Larry, very nice guy, very good friend of mine. Uh, he is dating a girl who was the neighbor, this is all very recently, she just moved, but up until about a few months ago, uh, she was the neighbor of Derek Bell. Uh, Derek Bell, of course, is one of the greatest race car drivers of all time. He's won Le Mans. He raced for Porsche. He raced for Ferrari. Incredible guy. Uh, I had the luck of driving around uh, Palm Beach International Raceway with him once when uh, Andrew, my friend, won some sort of 
uh, I don't know, like a Bentley test drive thing. And Derek Bell was representing Bentley, and he gave us all a ride around Palm Beach Raceway in a uh, uh, in a uh, Bentley uh, Continental GTC. So I got to sit next to him, and I mean, it was incredible. I mean, I'm terrified in this big 8,000-pound car, and, uh, you know, he's just flicking it around the corners. <laughs> it meant nothing to him. I mean, you could just tell uh, that there was nobody in the world more comfortable behind the wheel of a fast car than Derek Bell. Uh, but anyway, Larry had dinner with him and, you know, his wife and their wives, whatever. And I you know, said, man, what was it like working with Enzo? Ask him that, you know, ask him if Enzo was an asshole, a bastard, you know, to race for him. So Larry did. And uh, apparently Derek Bell reported back that Enzo was a very, very nice guy uh, who always treated him very well. And there were no issues at all. Of course, I wonder if Derek knows he'll be shot if he says otherwise. So who knows? Uh, but anyway, there's uh, there's a stupid little aside. Um, but uh, anyway, this generation of car, this 308, was made from 1975 all the way through 1985. And then it was replaced by the 328, which was essentially the same car. I mean, obviously different engines. They changed some of the treatments and whatnot. Oh, God, there I go forgetting to turn off the... Anyway, the 328 was essentially uh, the same car. Uh, it replaced the Dino. Uh, which has an interesting history, the Ferrari Dino. Uh, it was named for Enzo's son. Uh, the, tragically, he passed away. He was an engineer uh, for Ferrari as a young man, and apparently he was working on the car that would become the Dino. And uh, he died of uh, a genetic illness that he had from birth. And uh, Ferrari decided to name the car after him. Uh, Ferrari Enzo, I should say, uh, had always said that he would never have anything other other than a V12 in his road cars. That was just the way it was going to be, or a flat 12, whatever. And um, so when the Dino came out, he did it, you know, he took the Ferrari name off it. Uh, it was badged as a Dino, as if the Dino were the actual maker. And uh, that lasted not very long. In fact, probably uh, days in most <laughs> cases, because when the car would get on a boat, uh, either the importer himself or the uh, first owner would instantly put Ferrari badges all over it, as you know, far as and as a long way from the gaze of Enzo. Um, so anyway, this car replaced that, and that was the you know the first. And you could argue that it was the money guys at Ferrari, the accountants, who said, "Man, we need to have an entry level car that people can buy," and uh, that's what this car was supposed to be. And you know, bigger production, the Berlin had a boxer was out at the same time the Daytona was out you know when the Dino was out and these were incredible V12 you know high performance cars but they were absolutely unobtainium they cost an absolute fortune and uh, that's uh, you know why the accountants kind of wanted something that a more average guy could buy and you know that's funny considering what this thing cost but um, anyway so it was the successor to the Dino and uh, it worked. It worked pretty well. It actually sold pretty well right out of the uh, right out of the box. When it got on Magnum PI, that just sent it through the roof, and it became the best-selling Ferrari of all time. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute, anyway. Uh, 308. Uh, that essentially means three-liter V8. Uh, you know, something that I didn't realize. And here's a little uh, tip of the hat to a fella I talked to the other day named Emil. He's a Ferrari tech, um, I want to say out of New Jersey. I don't remember immediately. Very nice guy. I talked to him on the phone, and he helped me find the gas door on this car, which we'll get into him. And thank God for that, because I'd have been there at the gas station for hours otherwise. But he explained a little bit of the Ferrari nomenclature to me in that, um, you know, like there's a 456 Ferrari that's out. And, you know, people assume that it's, you know, four seat 5.6 liter, which is not actually true. In fact, 456 stands for the displacement of one cylinder. So if you multiply that by the number of cylinders, you actually come up with uh, 5.6 liters. And uh, apparently that was uh, an historical a bit of Ferrari nomenclature. That was, that was something that I learned when I uh, started doing this car, but uh, it's an aside. Uh, GTS stands for Gran Turismo Spider, and uh, there was also a GTB at the same time, which stood for Gran Turismo Berlinetta, which was a coupe, a hardtop coupe. Didn't have this uh, target top in the middle. Uh, spider is an interesting term. 
you know, you see a lot of these things. You see the Fiat 124 Spider, the Porsche Boxster Spider, Spy 550 Spider. It's been a name that's been around for a long time. And there's no really good reason for it. Uh, it really shouldn't exist at all, or at least it's from the horseless carriage days. And apparently uh, back then it meant some sort of light little buggy uh, that had big wheels and was essentially a sporty buggy. So if you were a racy guy, uh, you might end up owning a, uh, uh, you know, one of these old horseless carriage spiders. And I guess if you squinted, they looked a little bit like a spider, uh, which is where the name came from. Uh, I guess when car companies started making cars, they needed to get names. You know, they took the name Phaeton from the horseless buggy thing, and they borrowed the name Spider, mostly for their sporty open-top cars. <clears throat> okay, so you've got that. You've got that going. So why the why? I mean, you see sometimes spider with an I, and you see it with a why. Uh, no reason for that either. Probably the Germans uh, started using the uh, spider with the Y just because it looked cool. <laughs> I have to love shit like that. I really do. So first of all, you've got the name Spider being picked because it sounds cool, and then you've got the Y in Spider being picked because it looks cool. I thought the Germans would be above all that. Uh, probably the Germans, by the way, because there is no Y uh, in the Italian alphabet. It doesn't exist. So they... Yeah, almost certainly it wasn't the Italians who started putting Y in Spider. I could find only one Ferrari that had the name Spider with a Y. And uh, that was the late 50s, the uh, 250 GT California Spider. Uh, but of course, that was made for export to the U.S. only. So that's probably why they picked that name. And in fact, that car has uh, become very famous because of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, if you remember that. That's got to be one of the finest, most amazing uh, road-going cars of all time out of the 250 series of Ferraris, which came out, yeah, they're just an amazing series of cars. Uh, the 250 GTO and uh, some of the others were just absolutely shocking. So, uh, but anyway, so this is a childhood dream fulfilled, and uh, it's an absolute joy for me to be piloting this thing around. Bear with me a minute. I'm going to dry off for a second. I'm going to recollect my thoughts, and I might even have another sip of Corona whiskey, and <laughs> we'll get right back into it. All right, that's a little bit better. I feel a little bit more dry, and there was a fire ant biting my ankle, which is fantastic, and it's throbbing right now. Uh, but uh, obviously, Peter needs to uh, come back from his gallivanting around Europe, you know, dating women half his age, enjoying himself, again, lighting cigars with his $100 bills while I'm slogging away here. And, uh, you know, he should really at least uh, call an exterminator and have some of the fire ants removed from the yard so I don't have to add insult to injury or injury to insult anyway. Oh, God, but I digress. So, any, it, look, it's difficult for me to be objective about this car. It really, really is. I mean, again, this thing is a friggin' icon. It's an icon of my youth, and it's an icon of the at-large popular culture. So, uh, you know, how do you critique it? How do you look at it objectively as a car when, you know, it's a love thing for you? And that was going to be very difficult for me. Uh, my expectations when I drove it, they were not going to be high, uh, because this is essentially a Malaysian era car. I mean, more, I mean, right in the damn middle of it. I mean, when this thing came out, the road was filled with Mark V's and Cardobas and custom cruiser wagons and, you know, all of these 140 horsepower V8 downsized GM, Ford, and Chrysler products that, you know, everybody just <laughs> thought were miserable. You know, I mean, it was uh, a time when it was, everyone was getting crushed. All the makers were being crushed by the constantly changing body standards, bumper standards, emission standards, rollover stuff. Uh, you know, they were flummoxed by it. The, the standards were changing every year. Uh, they had to keep working to keep up with it. And it was a very tough time for car makers. And this thing had has one foot in the uh, past and one foot in the future. I mean, it's, you know, it, when you look at the design, when you look at the style, it's reminiscent of the Dino, it's reminiscent of the 250 series Ferraris. Uh, it definitely has a classic vibe to it, both inside and out. Uh, yet at the same time, you've got five mile an hour bumpers, you've got, uh, you know, increased emissions, you've got catalytic converters, you've got all this stuff that was coming from the future. So it was a very difficult time for these companies. And as such, I had 
a feeling that it was not going to be an extremely fast car, and that was, of course, true. Uh, you know, it was pretty quick for the time, no doubt about that, but uh, by today's standards, any average performance car will lay waste to it. I mean, I think we're talking about 0 to 60 in about 6 seconds, a quarter mile time in the 15 range, top speed of a 150 or so. I mean, basically a V6 Camry would give this thing a run for its money today. Uh, but I, you know, I knew that, and I decided that it wasn't really going to matter. You know, the, the question was, was it a real Ferrari, the way that I thought of that California? You know, I decided that, that was. And uh, if so, was it fun to drive? And uh, I can answer yes. I mean, I, I, it absolutely resounding yes on both counts. In fact, I think it's more of a real Ferrari than the California was, and I think it's probably more fun to drive than the California was. And I think that's because it drives much more like a... Uh well, like a vintage car than a modern car, and, and that's all it needs to do. Uh, it was out at the same, two cars were, well, the Daytona was out at the same time as the Dino. And then the uh, Berlinetta Boxer, the BB512, was out at the same time as this. And those were 12-cylinder models. And this car was never meant to be as quick or as performance-oriented as them. In fact, I think the accountants mostly meant it to be fairly affordable, uh, which, whether it was or not, is, is kind of debatable. I mean, in 78, this car was 40 grand, roughly, uh, which amounts to about 170,000 today, which is not altogether different from what your uh, entry-level Ferraris are going going for now. So uh, it was in no way a cheap car. But of course, the Boxers and Daytonas cost a lot more at the time. So uh, it uh, it was affordable to some. Uh, there was also a Bertone-designed uh, GT4 that was badged as a Dino. And it was very creased and angular. And this uh, that car was out at the same time. I don't think that was very attractive. I don't think it's aged as well, not even nearly as well as this car. Uh, but of course, that was designed by Bertone. Tony, and this one was designed by Pininfarina, uh, specifically Leonardo Fioravanti, a uh, very famous uh, Pininfarina designer who did the Daytona, the Dino, and the Berlinetta Boxer. So, um, you know, obviously that guy has some skills. Uh, but, you know, thanks to its very public image, in no small part because of its movie star status on television and the movies, uh, this is the Ferrari that most people, uh, at least people my age, knew. It's the one that broke through to people who otherwise wouldn't have a clue what a Ferrari was like. And uh, that uh, is why it became an incredible symbol for, again, the moneyed elite of the world. Uh, you know, it's why this car made Ferrari the name that it is today instead of just something you know, that the, the enthusiasts knew about. Uh, you know, it's it, everybody knows about Ferrari, and in no small part, that's because of this car. So how the hell am I supposed to review this thing and look at it as a car and talk about its shortcomings or its issues? And, you know, the thing is a legend, basically. So not only is it one of the great cars of my youth, but it's it's a cultural icon in the sense that uh, it is what, um, it's what spawned Ferrari to become what it is today. Uh, the look of the car is incredibly Italian. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it is an incredible mixture of muscular and sensuous curves. Uh, it's got masculine features and very, very feminine, lovely features. Um, the pop-up lights, epic, absolutely epic. I mean, if there's one thing in the world that I love, it's pop-up headlights, and we'll get into those in a minute. Uh, the five-spoke wheels, they're iconic. Uh, what are they called? Chromadoras, 14-inch wheels. Later on, you could get a very similar looking wheel in 16 as you know things progressed uh, but uh, you know everything about it just oh god do I love it I also love the removable top you know the um and again, that sort of fit with the time because it was sort of the 80s or becoming the 80s. This, you know, look at me, I'm on display, here I am. And uh, of course, Magnum PI fit right into that. So um, to me, the car is just drop dead beautiful. I love all the louvers on it, you know, the side windows, the uh, louver deck lid here in the back, the Ferrari badge, the four round lamps, uh, the uh, four pipes coming out the back. The um, This one being an American model has 
longer bumpers than the Euro models did. Uh, you know, I'm sure some Euro people looking at it think, oh my God, look at those hideous bumpers. But, you know, to Americans, we grew up with this stuff, so it just looks totally normal to us. It, it, you know, I see a Euro spec car with the shorter bumpers, and yeah, it looks good, but it, uh, it just makes absolutely no difference to me. Um, I tell you what, let's just get right into this thing. So maybe we'll keep this review under 40 minutes for once. I'm going to pause for a minute because it's a two-handed job to open the, uh, uh, the hatch. So hold on one moment. All right, so here it is. So this is a mid-engine car, which of course gives... Uh, truly the best balance for a vehicle. Some of the, like the Daytona was a front-engine V12, uh, the Boxer was mid-engined, and this is mid-engined, but uh, unlike those cars, this is a V8 and not a uh, V12. Um, it's transversely mounted, as is the uh, transaxle that runs next to it. It's in front of the rear axles. Uh, it's, you know, again, badged as a uh, three liter, but is really a 2.9. I don't know why companies always do that, but they do. Uh, this one is early enough that it still has carburation. So uh, underneath there, you'd have um, uh, four uh, twin choke Webers, which is quite nice. Or is it six? I don't know. I think it's four. Anyway, so you've got that Weber carburation under there. It went to an injected model, the 308 GTSI afterwards, uh, which added Bosch fuel injection. And, you know, that helped with emissions and cleanliness and all that kind of crap, but it did take away some horsepower. Uh, in fact, the earliest version of this car uh, was actually probably the most desirable because it's made in fiberglass, uh, which is much lighter than the steel body, which came out in late 1977. And and the, uh, the engine was a little bit less restricted, so it had a ton of horsepower. And in fact, the European versions always had a little bit more horsepower than the American. So uh, I'm guessing a 75, 6, early 77 fiberglass uh, 308, probably the B, not the S, with the fixed top is the most valuable of these. Uh, but, um, you know, that is what it is because they're, they're the quickest, you know, no doubt. And uh, they became, and then the Quattro Valvo came out, a name I have a hard time saying, uh, after the GTSI, and that got the horsepower back up by adding uh, four valves per cylinder to it. So uh, there were quite a few different engine tweaks and tunes during the production years of this car. In fact, there was a version made for uh, the Italian market where um, cars under a certain displacement qualified for lower taxes and insurance. So there was a like a 1.9, they called it a 208, but there was a 1.9 turbocharged version of this car with a V8, 121 cubic inch V8, uh, which is insane. And uh, I believe that is the smallest V8 that's ever made. And uh, anyway, that, uh, that was for the Italian market, but that's an aside. Uh, but even then, a 2.9 liter V8 is quite small. And that's because Ferrari has always sort of had this Formula One technology as part of their uh, shtick, even in their road going cars. It borrows a lot from F1. And they use these smaller displacement engines that rev highly and freely uh, up to insane numbers, you know, in the F1 cars. That, that's why the screaming sound, which they lost at one point, make that the subject of another video. It's disgusting. Now the F1 cars sound like V6 Buicks, but uh, anyway, so they have these little tiny pistons, this little displacement, this free revving thing, and uh, that's how you end up with such a small displacement V8 that's an absolute screamer. Uh, but uh, it's very, very well balanced being mid-engined. Uh, it uses, you know, again, at the time it was probably technologically sufficient, but now it's quite normal and quite vintage. You've got uh, wishbones and coil springs and uh, front and rear sway bars and gas shocks and uh, manual steering in the front, rack and pinion with no assist, which is uh, a mixture of annoying and fantastic at the same time, which we'll get into. But uh, there it is. There's the engine of the scar and uh, the Weber carburation, making it probably one of the more desirable uh, of the 308 series. You see the big uh, emissions badge back there. Do they call it a three or do they call it a two? 178 cubic inches. They're not talking about liters. So yeah, whatever. Hell with it. 
All right. Uh, you also see this little trunk compartment here. Uh, famously, these um, these ended up going south and not working. In fact, I don't think the zipper works on this one. Uh, people just sort of leave it down, and that's what I'm doing here. You could replace the zipper, which would be fine. Uh, but otherwise, there you go. So there's your storage space in the car. Uh, this one still has the tool kit with it, which is quite nice. You see all these Ferrari tools. People rob these and sell them for thousands on eBay. And uh, I think that's more of the uh, jacking hardware were there so uh, anyway everything nice and lovely uh, here in the back I do also believe this car has been converted to an electronic ignition uh, doing away with the point system uh, which uh, helps to make it just a little bit smoother and more reliable and there you see the tops of the coilovers all very nice stuff and uh, ready to go. Uh, this thing was actually restored, um, I want to say in 2017. The whole car basically came apart and uh, everything was reserviced and redone on it. So, um, yeah, you know, 17, it's a little bit <laughs> in Ferrari years. It may be due for another one, who knows? But uh, anyway, very, very nice and proper engine uh, under the bonnet of this car. So let's go over and look under the front. One interesting thing is all these weird hidden, like everything's hidden. The door handle here, you wouldn't know unless you knew. And then the interior door handle is hidden under here. So I don't know why Ferrari thought it was necessary to hide handles. And this is where uh, Emil helped me out a lot. Very, very nice guy. Let me see if I can get this in here. Um, interestingly, these louvers are keyed, presumably so you can clean the windshield on the other side and on this side so you can get to the uh, gas cap, which still has that big flip-out flapper so you don't spill any gasoline on the uh, on the Ferrari red paint. So let me get that back in. Very nice. And we'll have a look under the front. See what we got there. And what we got is a spare tire and not much else. Of course, you see the radiator for the car. You see the twin cooling fans. And, uh, of course, the um, uh, the washer uh, for the windshield. And that's it. So uh, you're not going to fit any more luggage under the front. Uh, in the 80s, you might have filled up that spare tire with kilos of cocaine or, you know, had them underneath here or something to sort of run it past the state troopers. Uh, but otherwise, forget about any luggage. Whatever you got is going to have to be behind the... Uh, behind the back. To lower that, I think you got to push this guy and then let it fall from a reasonable height. Very nice stuff. So yeah, most of your stuff is going to have to be there in the back. Let's see if we can get this down with the camera rolling. Oh my god, that's actually a fairly heavy deck lid. But uh, there you see the Ferrari badge, the prancing horse on the back. Uh, the earlier cars had one tailpipe. Thank God that changed. And we got these quad pipes coming out, which look a hell of a lot nicer. So anyway, there it is. And I'm going to pause again, uh, get my shit inside the car and uh, the license plate on the back. Then we're going to hop in and go for a spin. All right, everything in. So they're building me a new office at work because apparently the, the, where I'm sitting currently is too close to the sales guys and I'm inflicting them with uh, negativity and pessimism and an all around hatred of life. So uh, they want to segregate me from that. And frankly, um, you know, I can't blame them. So. Anyway, so I've got a new office coming up with a bigger desk, and I thought, what the hell, I'm going to come up with some decor. So I found this the other day. I mean, is this fantastic? Uh, it's a Chernobyl snow globe. I mean, where are you going to find something like that? Well, I did, so I guess it's not that hard. But, um, yeah, you know, I thought, what the hell. Apparently, you leave it out in the sun, and it actually ends up glowing. Not unlike all the, uh, you know, animals and everything else that was around Chernobyl. So, anyway, that's going to go on the desk. I'm very happy with that. Uh, it's Friday, so I got donuts for the guys. And otherwise, all my bag of crap in the back. So, let's get this down. Hop inside the car. And then we're going to go for a spin. Right, why the hell isn't that closing? They don't have that down, that's why. There we go, that's better. God, I do love the lines of this car. These big side vents, these big air intakes, those are truly what does it for me. And I swear at speed, you can uh, you can hear the air getting sucked into that thing. Uh, there's the uh, design by uh, Pin and Farina badge on the bottom. Very, very cool. And I do love the little aero mirrors that it has. And let's see these pop-up headlights while we're outside. 
Look at, oh, there we go. Oh, come on. <laughs> so now we've got them. That one was a little sketchy at first. Big round lamps, looks very, very cool. And uh, man, am I a sucker for pop-up headlights. No question about that. All right, so let's get in this thing and take it for a spin. So now the interior is all very Italian. I mean, no question about that. It's as Italian as the outside. You've got this uh, three-spoke uh, Nardi looking steering wheel with a leather grip that's very nice. I do appreciate the way the door panels swoop into the dashboard. That sort of predates a look that came much later. Uh, you've got these interesting pockets. In the sides of the doors, that'd be a good spot for some sort of little Beretta pistol or some other, you know, handgun you might use. Uh, the seats, just a very standard-looking leather. That you know, the smell of this car inside—it's like a mixture of Jaguar and and Fiat or something. It's just a very unique Ferrari smell from at least these vintage cars that you don't get anymore. Uh, under this cover here is the uh, top that uh, will, you know, bolt on the top, the target top, very nicely bolts on there and uses these sort of vintage clasps that remind me of an old Triumph or something. Get those on so it doesn't flap around while we're driving. And that's a very elegant solution. Uh, the seating position is pretty racy, I have to say, which I think is kind of a vintage Ferrari thing. Uh, you know, again, so much of Ferrari was tied to racing, and specifically Formula One racing, uh, that it, um, you know, so much of it came over to that feeling. For everything from the engine, from this gated shifter, uh, to, uh, to the way you sit inside the car. Uh, the gauges are fascinating. You've got a clock down here, which is very hard to see when you're driving, uh, as is the uh, oil temperature gauge, which is important, but probably not that important. More, more important on a big Chevy truck than a Ferrari. Uh, you got 180 mile an hour speedo. Nice. You've got, um, there you see the 7700 uh, redline tack there on the uh, right, uh, Viglia gauge. Nice. You've got your fuel gauge, your water temp, and your oil pressure in the center. All very racy. And then a whole variety of uh, warning lights. This one is when you're running the electric fans. I don't know why you need that, but you do. Can't remember what that one is, or this one, or but whatever. It's got all sorts of... Uh, uh, warning lights down here. You see these are interesting slow down cylinder one through four and cylinder five through eight Couldn't even find that in the owner's manual. It turns out those are Sensors that are on the catalytic converters and uh, if it senses something is askew with them Then it's going to turn on those lights if it's dumping raw fuel in if you've got a bank that's down uh, If uh, the cat efficiency is down or screwed up It's going to tell you slow the hell down and you know take it easy for a minute. Let's get this thing together so uh, so that's that. Uh, you got, you know, very nice laid out dash. You got a nice little hump, pod hump there for the cluster. I'm not a big fan of this JVC radio it has. I'd probably put something more vintage in there if I owned this, but it's fine. Uh, it does have air conditioning. It's got a center console with a little place to put your bags of drugs in the 80s. Uh, the gated shifter with the dog leg pattern is awesome. Uh, you know, I mean, this is straight out of a race car, the whole gated shifter thing. And by dog legs, you've got reverse up in the left, you've got first here, and so first to second is kind of a an interesting maneuver. You know, you have to go over and up. Uh, what you know that had a lot of favor back in the 70s when it was all five speeds, but when everything went to six speeds, that became a little bit more rare because it didn't really fit the pattern. Uh, but this is awesome, and here's why: you're not in first that often. Certainly not when you're on a track or in a racing position. Uh, you are in second and third a lot, and they're your most fun and most prolific gears. And in this case, it's up and down with barely a maneuver. So uh, the dog leg thing is a terrific uh, setup for racing. And frankly, I miss it today. Uh, you got an ashtray here because yeah, it's the 70s or 80s. People smoked. You got your air conditioning. You got your cigarette lighter. You got all these great little switches with chrome surrounds, all the hieroglyphics on it, all very Italian, all very cool, and uh, just neat to see. Uh, and of course the choke. Uh, I have my douchebag uh, leather gloves here if I want to put those on. 
and I can look like a real numb nuts, like an orthodontist who shouldn't have been able to afford a Ferrari in his youth, but uh, made a lot of money and decided he'd have one, and as such, he's going to have leather racing gloves when he gets in his car. Probably those little moccasins as well. Let's fire this thing up. It's a pretty traditional affair. Key in there. I'm going to give it a couple pumps. I don't know, why am I turning the wipers on? Because I'm hitting that stupid switch. Oh, for the love of God. Everything's so hard one-handed. I swear to God it is. Sort of a sickly, weird starter sound these old Ferraris have. I've, you know, it's just sort of interesting, but um, man, there it is. Fires to life. You know, not the most particularly great sounding engine in this thing with the eight cylinder and whatnot. Um, you know, certainly a V12 sort of Ferrari sounds a lot sweeter, but it's good enough. I, you know, I could compare it to a 911 and so with all the whirrings and engine sounds, I, I mean, it's enough. It gets the job done and uh, that's really all you need. And of course the shifter with the gas. I mean, driving this car is just fantastic, even if it's somewhat difficult. The steering, you know, if you drove this thing around the city for a month, you'd end up looking like Popeye. I mean, the steering effort is not light, but my God, are you connected to the wheel? Yeah, the front wheels is a, this just doesn't happen with cars today. The front wheels are a direct connection to the steering wheel. And uh, what you get for feedback, for feel, is just absolutely incredible and very befitting a sports car. Uh, when you hit a bump, you're really gonna know just how connected you are. Uh, mate that to that gated shifter, which makes the beautiful clanging noises, the dog-like pattern, uh, the brakes, Eh, the brakes are there. They're vented discs, but you can't really say they're terrific, but they're there. I think if the thing had better brakes, it would be less scary to drive at a very high rate of speed. Uh, now, this is not my Ferrari, so I'm not. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm not going to beat the crap out of this thing. I'm going to give it a little bit of a run. I don't even know if I'm going to do the highway thing on this, but uh, we'll have some fun anyway. too high because we're not at temp yet and of course that is extremely important in a car like this so we're going to short shift a little bit until we get to the 190 range and you know part of this right now is oh my god I'm driving a 308 you know I mean I'm not really even sitting there oh is it nice is it steering well is it feel good is it this that the other I mean I'm driving a 308 and I mean <laughs> to me is enough. This is the, you know, the joy of my youth. I feel like I'm walking into a nightclub with, you know, a 1980s Tawny Katane on my arm. It's just that awesome uh, to be behind the wheel of this car. Um, I love the big fender. I mean, there you look, when you're looking down this thing, the ergonomics suck. I'm way too close to the uh, rear view mirror. I've got the top of this raked windshield right at my head. Uh, I could only imagine how Tom Selleck felt in this thing, you know, being giant. I mean, it's not too small inside, but the ergonomics are terrible. And I don't care. And I doubt very much that the people who built it cared either, because that wasn't really the point. They didn't really give a crap if the mirror was too close. I think they just wanted the thing to uh, drive in a very fun manner. So, there's our temperature. We're getting there. God, everything is so hard with one hand. I mean, I could just do that all day. So I think I'll give this little driving bit here without too much commentary because it's just fun. Well, definitely not make you wait through the light. So I tell you what. 
thank you very much for having a look. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to pick it up again in a minute, do another little bit of a drive, and, uh, and I'll do that without comment. So we will uh, see you with the next one. Hopefully I get something fun, and uh, we'll keep going. Thanks for having a look. Oh, if you have an interest in this car, give the guys at Auto House a call. 239-263-8500 uh, on the web at autohousenaples.com. Thank you so much, and uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.